Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, where we're going to be talking about uh, some tips and tricks for your digital classroom management. While we uh, get started with a few housekeeping things, please use the chat to the right of the video to tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, and what your role is in education. An on-demand version of this webinar will be available at this very same YouTube link immediately after the webinar is over. You can visit forward-edge.net forward slash webinars for all of our webinar recordings. Feel free to share what you're learning on Twitter with the hashtag FEK12 that you see on the screen. Okay, so let's get started. My name is Katie Seamer, and I am the Director of the Curriculum and Technology Integration Department here at Forward Edge. And our main presenter today will be Brooke Franklin. She is one of our integration specialists on the team. We'll be using that chat area to the right of the video to share any links that you may need uh, throughout today's presentation. And we also encourage you to use this chat area to ask us any questions that you may have so we can address those during the live session. And then also to share your own ideas too, because that's the beauty of us bringing uh, educators together. So please use that group chat area uh, to share ideas and ask questions. And we'll try to address those either using the chat or Brooke will address those uh, during the presentation. So just a little bit more about Forward Edge in case you're tuning in and you're not sure who we are. We are a K-12 technology company. And when I say that, I mean that we do all things technology for schools, including selling hardware, setting up and managing wireless networks. And we even have our own cabling team that will pull in our own cables, hang APs, move projectors, so on and so forth. And so a little over three and a half years ago, we began to focus heavily on the curriculum and integration side of things. So once you have that technology in teachers and students' hands, how do you use it effectively for teaching and learning? And so in the CNI department, we come with an education background and classroom experience. And in short, we offer visioning and planning services, provide professional development, and serve as on-site integration coaches to schools. So now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Brooke. Hi, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be talking about classroom management um, in a digital classroom. Um, so looking at our ISTE standards, um, this is going to address a couple of different standards for educators. Um, so the first one is the citizen um, standard. So this is where educators inspire students to positively contribute to and responsibly participate in the digital world. Um, the next ISTE standard that this webinar will address um, is the designer standard for educators. Um, so educators design authentic learner-driven activities and environments. And then the last educator standard that um, we're going to be focused on is the facilitator. So this is when educators facilitate learning with technology to support student achievement. Um, so this stand or this webinar for students um, will also address some ISTE standards, um, including the empowered learner. Um, so this is when students leverage technology to take an active role in choosing, achieving, and demonstrating competency in their learning goals. Um, and then also digital citizen. So students recognize the, the rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of living, learning, and working in an interconnected digital world. And they act and model in ways that are safe, legal, and ethical. So in this month's webinar, um, talking about classroom management um, in a digital classroom, classroom management can sometimes be a painful topic for us as teachers. Um, often when I talk to educators who are struggling with digital classroom management, they are pretty quick to identify several reasons for those off-task behaviors, for disorganization, um, and the overall interrupted flow of their classroom. And often we struggle to reflect on how our own teaching practice is contributing to that struggle. So today I challenge you to be open-minded and willing to grow as we examine four gears of effective classroom management in the digital classroom. So those four gears are going to be the classroom environment, classroom procedures, student engagement, and tech zen. So to kick off our talk, I want to talk about this quote um, by Harry Wong. So he says, the number one problem in the classrooms is not discipline. It is the lack of authentic learning tasks, procedures, and routines. 
Well, as we talk today, we're going to focus on proactive strategies to effectively manage your technology-infused classroom. We will discuss multiple ways to make learning more authentic for your students, how to create effective technology procedures and routines, and how to prepare students to use technology appropriately and responsibly. So technology is a powerful tool in education. It allows us to access information and give students academic experiences that were formerly inconceivable. And as technology evolves, education is also evolving. Teachers are no longer the content masters in the room. The internet allows students to access more information than one individual teacher could ever know. And our role as teachers is shifting from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. We are now the expert guides that help students navigate the digital world. And with this shift, we must also learn how to embrace the sometimes daunting world of technology in a valuable and meaningful way. And at the core of effective instruction is effective classroom management. And as our role as teachers shifts, we must also evolve our classroom management practices to support this new role. So let's go ahead and dive into our first gear of effective classroom management um, in the digital classroom, which is the actual classroom environment. Arranging the learning space is one of the most important things to consider when establishing your learning environment. The way that your classroom is set up either promotes or limits how your students will interact with your lesson. When we look at these pictures, the similarities are pretty striking. The traditional seating arrangement of rows, isolating, or rows of isolated desks reflect one type of instruction, the sit and get. And in this arrangement, students are often passive receivers of information presented to them by the teacher. And while this arrangement is sometimes necessary, it should not be a permanent fixture in your classroom. This arrangement isolates students from each other with space as a physical barrier to collaboration. When arranging your classroom, consider the following. Consider the learning task. Um, learning tasks often vary, um, and it's important to make sure that the actual space um, will work well for your learning task. Um, so sometimes cemetery seating is needed, um, but collaboration is also really important. And sometimes teachers are hesitant to use the small group configurations um, because there's a fear of over socializing, students not working well together, or some students doing all of the work for the group. And it's important to remember that collaboration is not a natural skill. It has to be taught. When preparing students for the connected world and workforce they are entering, we must intentionally teach them how to work with a diverse range of people. I encourage you to think about how your classroom setup allows for those teaching moments. The second point to consider when establishing your classroom arrangement is teacher mobility. Um, so the teacher wants to be able to get to each student quickly without obstacles. So when the teachers are actively circulating the room, kids not only feel more confident in asking a question because they know that you are easily reachable, but they also are less likely to get off task on other websites. So throughout the year, you shouldn't just have one classroom set up. Classroom configurations should change frequently to allow for the type of learning required by the learning task. So a lot of the schools that we've worked with here at Forward Edge um, have actually pursued different AV setups um, that will allow students to be more mobile. So having a mobile keyboard um, or having um, access to change that um, presentation without being right in front of the room. The next element of establishing an effective digital classroom environment is developing tech-minded rules and consequences. So when you first create your technology rules, um, involve students in the rule and consequence making process. Establish with your students that the purpose of technology in your classroom is to use that technology for learning. And then have your students create rules that they think will support that goal. Um, so for example, only using websites in class for academic tasks or bringing your device fully charged. If your class gets overzealous and ends up with a pretty lengthy list of rules, you might want to help them condense it to a shorter and easier to remember list. Post that list publicly so that it can be a reference point for the remainder of the year. And one of the most important things when setting any type of expectation or rule in your class is practice. Um, the more you practice with your students, the more embedded it is in their routine. So often students learn by doing. 
have them practice those technology rules multiple times at the beginning of the year until they become embedded in their routine. Then revisit them throughout the year. Um, I like to have quarterly, like a quarterly expectations reboot at the beginning of each quarter, um, where at the beginning of every quarter, we would go back over those rules that we talked about at the beginning of the year, and then we would also practice them again. Um, also, make sure that you're setting rules that you can enforce. Um, and when students inevitably break them, because they will, relate that violation back to your overall tech goal of using technology for learning. Students buy into the why, not a list of instructions. So make sure that you go back to that overall purpose and intention that you set with students at the beginning of the year. The last element in our classroom environment gear is avoiding techno panic. When a student does break a technology rule or misuses technology, do not techno panic. Techno panic happens um, when issues arise and teachers blame the technology. The problem is typically the behavior, not the actual technology. So consider the digital equivalents of those old traditional behavior violations. So for example, when a student is chatting online with another student in class at a time that they're not supposed to, consider the non-digital equivalent, which would be passing notes. The issue is not the technology, it's the distracted behavior of the student. So make sure whenever you're correcting that behavior that you're addressing that as the distraction, as the behavior, not the physical technology. So when you're considering the consequence for breaking an expectation or rule, um, consider what you would do without technology for that behavior. So if a student is passing notes in class, you wouldn't confiscate all of their pens or their notebook because they wouldn't be able to complete their class work. You would address the behavior of the distraction. Student engagement is also key when it comes to distracted students. Um, towards um, the end of this webinar, we'll give you some great tool recommendations for keeping students engaged. Um, but for now, just keep that in the back of your head um, that student engagement really does eliminate a lot of those distracted behavior issues. Technology certainly can make um, behavior, negative behaviors easier to access if the behavior already exists, but technology is not the cause of those bad behaviors. Our second gear of effective digital classroom management is establishing good digital classroom procedures. First, let's take a look at digital organization. The organization has always been a necessity for good classroom management, but with increasing use of digital platforms to complete assignments, organization is changing just a little bit. So traditionally, to keep papers organized by class and assignment, teachers instructed students to write their name, class period, and date at the top of their paper. And while growing up, the format varied from teacher to teacher that I had. Every teacher that I had growing up had a specific format for how they wanted students um, to label their papers to help keep them stay organized. So this is critically important not only for teacher organization, um, but student organization as well. So the digital equivalent of keeping your students organized is to help them create naming conventions for those digital documents, just like we used to do with paper documents. Um, so if you're having students make copies of Google Documents um, by themselves, make sure that you give them a specific naming convention to use. So if you're teaching high school, that might look like last name, underscore first name, underscore classroom hour, and then assignment. Um, if you're teaching elementary, that might be a little more simple um, and just be the first name underscore assignment. So whatever you choose, make sure that it's consistent so that your students know what to expect. This helps you find their assignments and organize their assignments more easily, and it helps them go back and find their assignments as well. Um, so if your school uses an LMS um, like Google Classroom or Schoology, you might actually um, be able to name those documents for your students um, without them having to create those naming conventions themselves. Another common obstacle in the digital classroom is students' organizations of their digital files. So just as you wouldn't direct a student to just put this worksheet in your backpack or locker or with all of your other stuff, you also would not direct a student to save their work to their Google Drive or hard drive. This creates a chaotic mess where it is nearly impossible to find materials you are looking for. 
have students rename documents with your procedural naming convention and then direct them to move that file to a specific folder. Intentionally setting up digital folders with your students um, and then have them store digital resources in those folders will eliminate search time and frustration in class. I also highly recommend having students create a folder arch archive to house folders and materials from previous years. Can't tell you how many students I've seen have seven science folders and don't know which one is for this year. So make sure that you make that organization um, intentional at the beginning of the year. And it's never too late to start if your students haven't done that yet. Another thing to include um, is minimizing obstacles. Um, so minimizing obstacles through URL shorteners are a great way to organize your technology-infused classroom. Oftentimes, extra time is being spent in transition when students have to type a really long URL to access a website. Students often make errors, they type at different speeds, or they accidentally go to the wrong site. This means that you are running around in circles helping multiple students while kids that entered it correctly the first time are sitting bored and vulnerable to distraction. Using a URL shortener um, like Bitly is a great way to make those technology transitions seamless. So Bitly um, has two different platforms that you can use or two different ways you can use their platform. Um, they actually have a Bitly extension. So this first picture here shows you what that would look like. It's actually just a shortcut button at the top of your Chrome bar so that any website you're on, you can click that, um, that extension shortcut and you can create a shortened URL right there without ever exiting the website you're using. Um, or you can go to the Bitly website and you can copy the long URL that you're wanting to shorten and you can customize that text um, to an easy to remember phrase for your students. Another great way to minimize obstacles and reduce tech transition time is to hyperlink websites you are going to use in class to a digital agenda or your school's learning management system, such as Schoology or Google Classroom. And we'll talk about digital agendas in just a little bit. This allows students to transition between websites with a click of a link instead of typing in the address and risking errors or sparking a need for teacher assistance. Our next section um, is talking about teaching students how to use tech. For school. And this is very important um, when we look at forming good technology classroom procedures because often we assume that students are the, the students that we are teaching are digital natives. We assume that because they have grown up with technology, they know how to use it. But that's really only partially true. Students do know how to use technology, but not necessarily how to use it for school. Part of our classroom procedure should be teaching students how to use technology for school. So one way that you can do this in your classroom is to establish tech-related routines. Um, so here we have a couple really good examples for routines that you might consider. Um, so being prepared to learn, emphasizing to students um, that the supplies they need for class are not just a pencil and paper and notebook. Um, that they also have tech supplies. So tech supplies include their device, a full charge, and headphones. So just as we drill into students that they need to, what they need to be prepared for class, like those pencils, notebooks, and folders, we also need to teach students to bring those tech supplies to class. Ask three before me is another great tech-related routine to include in your classroom procedures. Um, so teaching students to use technology to foster independence and ownership of learning in your class. Um, make it one of your expectations that students use the tools at their disposal to find answers to their questions before asking you. It's also important to teach students when to use tech. And I found that this really varies from teacher to teacher. Um, and it really is just your preference. Do you want kids to immediately get on their technology and look at your digital agenda when they enter the class? Or do you want them to stay off of technology until they're directed to? Um, so whatever your preference, make sure that it is clear and that it is consistent um, so that your students know how to enter with technology. 
Um, and then the last routine I would recommend making explicit to your kids is um, transporting tech. So making sure that they know to use two hands, what is a safe surface, um, what is not a safe surface to put your device on, and making them practice those actions. So when teaching students how to use tech for school, um, another important thing that we need to consider is teaching them how to search. So while a Google search can return more information than we could possibly read in a lifetime, it's critical that we teach students how to search effectively. I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen students type entire prompt questions into Google. Teach students how to use these search bar shortcuts to filter the quality and relevance of the results that they receive. So Google and YouTube are both very powerful tools to use in class. And Google is the number one search engine in the world, and YouTube is number two, with the number one phrased search being, how do I? This tool and that phrase have become a cornerstone of how we learn as a society today. And yet, I hear many teachers complain about students using Google to look up answers for class assignments. Teachers should not be afraid of students looking up answers on Google. They should teach them how to use Google effectively and think critically about the information they receive. The technology that our students currently have is the worst technology that they will ever have in their life. They will forever be able to look up solutions to their problems on Google. And instead of wasting our in-class time teaching them material that they can find within three clicks of a Google search, we should explore how those tools can be used to cultivate critical thinking and design more rigorous learning activities. So encourage your students to become independent problem solvers by posting out a printout of these Google search terms in your room. Um, and you can probably find a really quick printable sheet um, just by Googling Google shortcuts. When teaching, how, when teaching students how to use technology in school, one of our cornerstones for classroom management has to be digital citizenship. This includes teaching them about internet safety, their digital footprint, information literacy, credit and copyright laws, and privacy and security. The teaching of digital citizenship must be a full year thing, not a beginning of the year thing. Similar to character education, we do not teach students about character education at the beginning of the year and then go the remainder of the year without mentioning it. It is something that is taught and reinforced frequently throughout the year. It is also not isolated to just one class. Digital citizenship must be taught and reinforced in every classroom using technology. It is not just the job of the technology teacher or the homeroom or advisory class. And when we look at bullying, for example, when teachers see bullying in the hallway, we don't say, oh, that's the job of the counselor to correct, or their homeroom teacher will be addressing that. Violations of digital citizenship, just like bullying, should be addressed by all teachers in all classes. So there are some really great tools out there to help teach your students about digital citizenship. Um, one of them is Common Sense Media, and the website is up there. Um, I believe Katie will put that in the chat for you guys. Um, so Common Sense Media is really great because it has a ton of free lessons, um, and they are leveled by grade. Um, it also includes free take-home resources for parents and guardians, um, because I've also found that this is a topic that parents and guardians also struggle with. Um, so I really like that as a resource to use um, to teach those lessons about digital citizenship. And then the other one that I would recommend would be Google's Interland. Um, and this is part of their Be Internet Awesome uh, movement. And this is a more gamified approach to teaching di digital citizenship um, where kids actually use an avatar to compete in games and then reflect on um, really up to date and current examples of what digital citizenship means. Alrighty, looking at a digital class agenda, this is another great way that we can um, have good digital classroom procedures. So benefits of a digital agenda, and what I mean by a digital agenda, when we think of the past, um, students would carry around planners and they wrote down all their work in planners. Um, teachers often have on the board the work that students are supposed to write down and there's a time at the beginning of class when all students copy from the board.
Um, a transition that you can make to help manage your digital classroom is taking that planner style agenda and putting it online for students. Um, so there are several different ways that you can do this. Um, this example on the screen that you're looking at right now is a Google Slides template. Um, but the benefits of a digital agenda is that students can access it 24 seven. Um, this means they always have access to it when they go home um, from any device, whether they're at school or not. Um, you can also, as a teacher, include links to resources and materials. Um, so not only do the kids have access to the agenda, but they also have access to all of those resources that you've used in class. Um, teachers can also easily provide parents access to the digital agenda. And then absent students can access information they missed even before they return to school. Um, so this is an example of Google Slides agenda template. You can also do a Google document, um, which is the one that we have on the left, and update it um, by each day. Um, if, you, if your school uses a learning management system like Schoology or Google Classroom, those are both great avenues to include your digital agenda on. Um, I've seen teachers use this as kind of the starting point for class where a teacher or where, when students come in, this is their landing spot um, to figure out what they need to do for class. Um, so whatever the method, there are several different benefits to using that dig digital classroom agenda. All right, attention grabbers um, is our next pointer for solidifying your classroom management procedures. And um, when you're using technology in class, it is very important that your students have a clear signal of when they are expected to transfer their attention from their screen to you. By establishing and practicing a couple of these quick attention grabbers, you can minimize that transition time between digital and non-digital activities in your class. And some attention grabbers that we found especially helpful are eye contact, earbuds out, hands off the keyboard, screens at 45. This means that students are physically tilting their screen to a 45 degree angle um, so that they cannot see the content that's on their screen. Signaling, so clap once if you hear me, clap twice if you hear me, and then screens facing forward. So this is when students would physically turn their computer all the way around to where their screen was facing the front of the room. Beyond trigger phrases, you can also try out these strategies um, as attention grabbers. So on-screen timers are a great way to include a visual to keep your kids on track of where they're supposed to be directing their attention. Um, so you can keep a timer on your screen, um, such as a Google five minute timer. Um, and this is actually a timer card. So if you just Google five minute timer, like this picture shows, um, you'll have a timer card. And then it also has different YouTube videos that you could pull up that are just fancier timers. Um, you can also use timer tab and that website is right there. And timer tab actually counts down on the tab of the website. So if you're wanting to set a timer, but you also need to have uh, maybe your Schoology page up for your kids, that timer will still show on that tab. And then we also have the three second challenge um, that some teachers have found um, very helpful. So this is where you challenge your kids to have everyone in the room looking at you within three seconds. Um, and there's a little reward or incentive attached to that. So another consideration that you might make when developing good tech procedures is using technology to provide extension activities to your early finishers or high achievers. Oftentimes, behavioral issues arise because a student is bored or is not intellectually engaged in the lesson. Extension activities that are embedded in your, in your classroom procedures gives students an academically centered task that keeps them engaged and interacting with the content in valuable ways during the time they would otherwise have nothing to do. I recommend having a poster of extension options for students to choose from and then making it an expectation that they work on something from that list when they do finish early. So one very valuable extension activity that you can do with technology is have your students work on a digital portfolio or blog. Um, so this is where you could encourage your students to extend on their thinking or work by having them reflect on their progress or experience with a task or project on their class blog page. Um, and there below, I have a couple of different recommendations of um, 
tools that you can use to have your kids create a blog. You can have them add pictures of their work to a digital portfolio. You can have them reflect on the highlights of that particular assignment or their growth. This type of task promotes authentic learning. So this goes back to the Harry Wong quote that we looked at at the beginning. Um, and this is an avenue where students can enjoy a real audience for their hard work. Um, so as the saying goes, when a student is sharing their work with the world, they want it to be good. When they are just sharing it with their teacher, they want it to be good enough. Having a blog page where they can um, share their work with the world or just their community um, or even just their other classmates um, or people within the school, it gives students a genuine audience um, and it promotes a deeper level of engagement with what's happening in the classroom. Another type of digital extension activity option is online simulations or games. Um, so these include Quizlet, Quizzes, Prodigy, um, or any subject specific software. <coughs> Excuse me. The important thing to remember when you are considering providing your kids with online simulations or games, you want to make sure that you vet them for academic relevance. Um, having kids choose their own game um, can often lead to students rushing through their classwork um, to play those games. So make sure that these games that are offered as extension activities really do um, pass the test for academic re relevance with the content that you're teaching them. You can also use these platforms to give students ownership of creating game material. Um, so websites like Kahoot or Quizlet, um, Students can use those to make their own games, um, and then you can use them for the class to practice and review, and that gives students ownership. Um, it also frees you up as a teacher to not have to create those review questions on your own. This fosters that student creator skill set. You could also have your high achieving early finishing students create a YouTube playlist about a specific topic to share with the class as a resource. Um, so I've used YouTube playlists a lot with having my kids create their own review playlist. Um, so my early finishers, my high achievers, my students that absolutely get it. Um, I might have them do a little extra research and create a review playlist um, that the rest of the class can use to study. So extension activities are a great classroom management tool um, because it ensures that your students will be academically focused um, even when they are done with the work that they had at hand. The most significant contributor to behavior problems in the classroom is a lack of student engagement. When students are invested in their learning task and engaged in your lesson, they are for the large majority not going to disrupt that lesson or task. So how do we achieve this utopian 100% student engagement? There are two things that I recommend. Number one, that you create authentic learning tasks like the one that we talked, or like, like we talked about earlier. Give your students a genuine purpose for learning and a genuine audience and watch the learning magic that starts to brew. I was working with a teacher just last week who is setting up a collaborative project for her class with another class in Bahrain. When she told the students about the project, they started to ask her questions like, is this where I should put a comma? Is this the correct adjective to, you, to use to describe this? When students have an authentic learning task, they begin to care about even the smallest of details. One of the cliche student questions that is inevitably asked is why do we need to know this? Make the answer to that question evident to your students before they even ask it. Show them that they're learning and their hard work has purpose through the learning tasks that you design for them. The second tip that I have for you is to explore some new tech tools. But I say this with a couple of warnings. Warning number one, don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. When you use tech tools in your class, make sure that they work with your student learning objective. Tech tools should not distract from the content you are teaching. They should enhance it. Before using tech tools, ask the following. Efficiency, is this the most time efficient choice? Learning impact, does this technology make a bigger impact on learning? And transferability, does learning 
or using a new technology gives students a skill they need in the future? If the answer is yes to any one of these, the chances are that you have a good tech fit on your hands. There are three specific tools that I recommend for when you do need to give your kids that sit and get material. They keep kids engaged in the lesson and break up the passive consumption of lecture style material. The first of which is Pear Deck. Pear Deck is an add-on that can be installed into Google Slides um, to embed formative assessments throughout um, presentations. And this keeps students engaged um, throughout a lecture and it also enables the teacher to collect um, formative assessment data in real time and use that to drive instruction. Um, so that's one that we really love here at Forward Edge. The second tool that I would recommend um, for engaging students in more of that lecture style material um, is Edpuzzle. So this is when you are able, or this tool enables you to take videos and embed questions throughout the video. So this actually works really great with YouTube videos. Um, so if you're considering doing a flipped classroom style or modified flipped classroom style, um, Edpuzzle is a great way to give your kids that content that they need to know um, and keep them engaged throughout receiving it before you dive deeper into that learning task. And then Kahoot um, is one that's been around for a little while now, um, but there's a variation on that that I think is pretty cool. Um, so Blind Kahoots um, is where you take Kahoot, uh, which is an interactive game, and you, instead of using it to review content, you use it to teach content. So you actually create the Kahoot um, and the questions for the Kahoot to be formative checkpoints throughout your lecture. Um, to assess where students are at or maybe poll them um, and get their opinion about that content that you're teaching. The last gear to having good classroom management in your digital classroom is maintaining your tech zen. Now so more than ever, teachers don't have to know all the answers. As our role shifts from sage on the stage and master of content to guide on the side and information navigation expert, we must accept that we do not and cannot have all of the answers to all technology and non-technology questions. I often hear teachers say, I'm not good with technology. And it almost becomes an excuse for them to ostracize technology from their classrooms. But you don't have to be good with technology to use it. Actually, it can work in your favor not to be good at it. Trying new things with technology in your classroom can create an opportunity for you to model a positive attitude toward learning to your students. Just like us adults, students are often afraid to take risks because of the possibility of failure. Take a risk with trying new technology with your students and model for them that it's okay to fail as long as you keep trying. The second way to reach your tech zen is to ask your students for help. Asking your students for help with technology gives them a chance to contribute to the classroom, be it a student leader uh, or be a student leader and shows them that you value their gifts and talents. And lastly, find your tech experts. These are the particularly techie kids in your class. Identify which kids seem to be naturally tech inclined and allow them to take a leadership role in the class as a tech expert. They can help other students who are struggling to navigate a tech tool. Um, they can help substitute teachers that might teach your class. They might help new students that aren't used to using the technology the rest of the students have used. And they can even give you tech advice. They will love the chance to showcase their leadership and tech gifts. One of the things that I have learned from the great veteran teachers that I have worked with is the importance of flexibility. Occasionally, there will be a bump in the road. And technology is no exception to that. The best way to achieve great classroom management with technology is to be proactive in setting up your classroom environment and procedures, keep yourself and your students digitally organized, and maintain your tech zen when you encounter bumps in the road. If you are interested in learning more about this topic, uh, many of the ideas for this presentation um, came from the book Classroom Management in the Digital Age by Heather Dowd and Patrick Green. And I highly, highly recommend adding this to your reading list. All right, thank you, Brooke. Um, Brooke did such a nice job, as she said in the beginning, classroom management um, can really be a dry topic.
Um, so she did a really nice job of putting together this presentation for us. Um, so just a couple of uh, quick announcements before um, we wrap up here. If you are interested in more training, um, we do a lot of different trainings, but some of the big things we do are Google Educator Boot Camps. Um, they are two and a half and two day boot camps to get you educator level one and two certified. So we do offer those. Um, I've shared a link to the websites with more information in there. Um, and you can also email me as well if you're interested in one of those boot camps. Uh, the next thing that we do is uh, that I want to share is an integration assessment. So if you're not really sure where to start with some of these trainings, maybe you are at the point where um, you know that that you or your teachers, if you're responsible for planning professional development, um, you know they they're just not even they're kind of at this classroom management point, um, and they need to better utilize some of the tools to keep students engaged and create those real authentic learning tasks. Um, but you're not really sure where to start. Um, we do an integration assessment. So um, it's a survey and for your teachers and students. And then we take it back. Uh, all of the data that we get from that information, it's aligned to ISTE standards for educators and students. And we put together a written report for you and then give you short and long-term recommendations. So that's always a great uh, starting point uh, to figure out where you're at uh, and where you need to go to help your district develop a professional development plan. It's also helped other districts obtain uh, grants, board approvals, and just general district support and buy-in for initiatives. And then last but not least, uh, please be sure to join us for our free monthly webinars. Next month is Digital tool Tools to Champion Diversity um, on November 14th, as always, at 4 p.m. Eastern. So I've also shared the link to that in the chat, and you can find the registration link to next month's webinar uh, on that web page. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to share them uh, in that chat area and we will answer them for you. We'll wait just another minute before we close up the recording here um, in case any questions don't come in. But we want to thank you for spending your time this afternoon with us um, or for watching the recording for those of you who will be watching the recording of this webinar. And as always, please don't hesitate to reach out for any questions and we will see you next month on the 14th.